thank you. The worship has been sweet already. Please take your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, and this evening we will be concentrating our attention on verses 8 through 21. It is a pleasure to be back with you uh, at Antioch. I count uh, your pastor as one of my friends, and I so appreciate uh, God's grace at work in you and through you and in this place, and uh, uh, so I'm so pleased, been looking forward to being here with you, and uh, I wish that my wife could have joined me, but she is holding down the fort back in the USA while I'm here and then up in Zambia for a couple of weeks, and then I'll be back in the United States for a couple more months of ministry uh, before we return home uh, to Kitwe. This evening, I want to speak to you on this subject, three unchanging foundational principles for modern missions. Three unchanging foundational principles for modern missions. We have gathered here this weekend for the SENT Missions Conference. And I would suggest to you that the missions conference is the business meeting where the church decides if they believe that people without Christ are worth saving. Missions is the church choosing whether or not to engage in a rescue operation to rescue people who are modern day slaves languishing in dark chains of sin. People who have been in bondage to Satan all of their lives without hope, without God in the world. My purpose in this message is to lay out for us a theological foundation for missions and to show you why you ought to continue to invest your time this weekend in being together as we Uh, engage in the scriptures and as we share and as we are challenged uh, to this work, this gospel work of, of missions. I want to show you why you should rearrange your priorities to participate in what God is going to do this weekend, but also what God is going to continue to do and do to perhaps a greater uh, measure through Antioch Bible Church, a work that will impact the nations for the glory of of God. The theme of Romans, as Paul writes, I believe the theme of the entire book is justification by faith. Again and again he speaks of the righteousness of God and its implications upon mankind. In fact, if you looked at the entire book, you could perhaps break it down this way. Justification by faith, chapters 1 through 3, explain, Paul explains why people need it. They are under God's wrath. Chapter 4 and 5 is how they get it, through faith in Christ. Chapter 6 through 8 is the change that happens because of it. Chapters 9 through 11, Paul focuses our attention on the fact that God is sovereign in it and man is responsible to receive it. And chapters 12 through 16, how are you to live after getting it? Today, as we assemble here, it is good for us to remember that there are an estimated 2.5 billion people who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. People who live in cultures and communities where there is no gospel preaching church like this one. Perhaps as as many as 40% of the world's population are in that category. Here on our own continent, according to the Joshua Project, there are 987 unreached people groups. These are ethno-linguistic peoples who live in an area and amongst a people with a shared culture, people who, who have no one engaging them with the gospel. There is no gospel preaching church in their community, in their location, seeking to proclaim the gospel to them. It's estimated that those 987 people groups on our continent um, have a population of an, est- an estimated population of, of over 380 million people. 
That is more than the entire population of, of the United States of America. 30% of Africans live amongst these peoples, unreached. You must listen carefully to each word, and I hope that you'll open your Bibles and that you'll follow along, but each of these words that I'm about to read to you from Romans chapter 15, verses 8 through 21. Now I want you to see that there are three big ideas that this evening we must understand and we must embrace. If we fail to get these truths, we will fail to obey God. And the result will be eternally devastating for many. Romans chapter 15, follow please as I read verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arise to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And I myself, verse 14, am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed." by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Father, we have gathered after a busy week, busy day. We have assembled ourselves before you to worship you, to think high thoughts of you. And we now approach your holy word. And we would ask Dear Spirit of God, that you would be present with us, that you would be our instructor, our teacher, our guide. Guide us into the truth of the passage. Help us to understand what the Apostle Paul is, is saying, and would you then apply these truths to each one of us? You know us. You know our thoughts. You know our fears. You know our failures. You know everything about us. I pray, dear God, that you would use your word to edify us, to encourage us, and to challenge us to think clearly and deeply about your mission, your purposes. Do that tonight and do that throughout the weekend together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In our text, Paul sets out three missions truths that you and I must believe and must embrace if we are to reach our generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here they are. Principle number one. Notice the mission is unchanged. We see that in verse 8 through 12. The mission is un unchanged. 
we are all, as the followers of Jesus Christ, to be on mission. But do we even understand what that really is? Notice, if you would, please, in, in these uh, first few verses, verses 8 through 12, two truths that we find here. Look at verse 8 and 9. Two, two, two big ideas here. Number one is that the mission begins with God. Look at verse Look at verse 8, I tell you that Christ became a servant of the circumcised, that's the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So the mission begins with God. Three unchanging foundational principles for modern mission. Principle number one, the mission is unchanged. This mission begins with God. Now, what is the mission? What is that word? Van Rienen defines mission as the work of God in reconciling sinful human beings to himself. This mission originated with God the Father. Jesus Christ enacted the mission. This mission centers on Jesus, and we see that in verse 8 and 9. It is Christ who came as a bond slave, as a servant to God, to fulfill the truthfulness of the Old Testament promises to the nation of Israel, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. This mission originates with God the Father. Jesus Christ, in the fullness of time, came to earth, and he enacted that mission. The Holy Spirit, Acts 1.8, gives power to the mission. The church, Acts 13, carries out the mission and the world receives the mission. Because this mission belongs to God, you and I have no right to redefine it or to change it or to modify it in any way. This is God's work. This is God's mission. Now, what happens when we take that word mission and we add an S to the end and we make it missions? Missions. What is missions? I would suggest to you that missions is the plan of committed believers to accomplish the mission of God. It's the plan that Antioch puts forth in order to carry out God's mission to the ends of the earth. That's missions. We're having a missions conference this week. And whatever that plan involves, that plan must, must ground itself upon the verbal proclamation of the gospel. And everything else that we may do Everything else that we may be involved with serves this purpose. I think it's very helpful at this point to remind ourselves that we must see a difference between ministries of mercy, which the church must be involved with, but we must see a difference between ministries of mercy and the mission of the church. Ministries of mercy demonstrate the love of God and perhaps open opportunities for the gospel. However, ministries of compassion alone do not save the lost. You can feed hungry people and put shoes on, on feet that have no shoes and, and you can provide lots of clean water to lots of people and you can do it in the name of Jesus and all of those people can still die in their sins and go to hell. So truth number one, the mission begins with God, but the second truth is this. This mission extends to all people. Someone who knows God must go and tell them about Christ and his sacrifice and live out this gospel transformation in front of them. In fact, in verse 9 again, it says, and in order that Jesus Christ came in his incarnation, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Notice 
notice this quotation. Uh, he proves this point from the, from the Old Testament. In verse number 9, Therefore I will praise you amongst the Gentiles and sing to your name. Here we see new worshipers who are, who are birthed, who come to saving faith. They, they hear of, of Jesus. They hear of God and they, they witness worship in, in verse 9. I will praise you among these peoples who have never heard of Jesus. I will sing to your name. The Gentiles here hear of God and they witness worship. Listen, unbelievers cannot worship. But I'll tell you one thing they do. When, 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 they, when they do find their way into our congregation and into our services, usually that's on a Sunday morning, isn't it, if they're going to be there. An unbeliever cannot worship. He's dead in his trespasses and sins, and yet he comes into our congregation and he watches us worship. And I'll tell you what an unbeliever is doing when they join us. They can't worship, but they're watching you and they're making an evaluation about whether or not you really believe this stuff yourself. There is a sense in which we witness by the way we worship. And that's what's happening here in this Old Testament passage is that, that, that these proclaimers of, of Jehovah, of Messiah, will, will worship. They will praise the name of the one and only true God in, in the presence of these pagan Gentiles, these unbelievers. They will sing to, to his name. Notice what happens in verse number 10. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. This is a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 43. Now you see the next, the next stage of this is, is, these, is these Gentiles are, are now joining with God's people in worship. This is perhaps the worship influenced by the missionary. The Gentiles here are participating with Israel in their worship. And then you come to verses 11 and 12. Praise the Lord all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah, the root of Jesse will come, even he who rises to rule the Gentiles, and in him the Gentiles hope. Here you have a demonstration of the indigenous worship of God. Gentiles now, they've watched the people of God worship, they've heard the truth of the gospel, they've placed their faith in it, and they've joined God's people in their worship, worshiping him from their heart in spirit and in truth, worship that's influenced by the missionary, as it were, and, and what was the end result? Now the Gentiles are, are worshiping God in their, in their own right. They're praising the Lord. New believers worship as they, as they see uh, those sent ones. But as they mature, they develop culturally appropriate expressions of heart worship towards God. So principle number one is this. The mission is unchanged. This mission begins with God and it extends to all people. But here's the second principle in our text. The power is unchanged. Look what he says in verse 13 and 14. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Look at verse, verse 19. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Notice the power is unchanged. This power radically transforms lives. You think of the writer of this, of this text, Paul himself. A rabid enemy of the gospel and of the church is struck by a vision of Jesus Christ on the Damascus road is radically transformed into the man that we know as the apostle Paul the apostle to the Gentiles verse 13 Paul reminds us that the Holy Spirit imparts faith in the word of God this hope to turn from the past life by faith and to offer themselves to God for this eternal future and grace. Verse 14, 
speaking of these former pagans, these Gentiles, he says of them, I am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourself are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. This, these evidences of grace in the lives of these formerly pagan people. Among these formerly unreached people, there are these new believers that Paul refers to, and he says, you are, I am convinced that you are full of goodness. This is the moral excellence. Moral excellence that is wrought by the Holy Spirit. He then mentions in verse 14 that these new believers are full of knowledge. It's not that they have, they, that they have learned all of the Scripture, and it's not perhaps that they've, they've matured completely in their understanding of the, of the things of God, and yet... They are full of knowledge. They have a genuine comprehension of the Christian faith. To the Corinthians, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. And such were some of you. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The, the, the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in these, in these formerly pagan peoples, these, these Gentiles. This whole laundry list of, of, of evil and, and depravity. And, and Paul says, and such were some of you. But look at the power of God's grace to reconcile these people to God and to transform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the miraculous working and power of the Spirit of God using the gospel and the word of God. And Paul says to these new believers, this relatively new church at Rome, I am full of confidence in you. Why? Because, because they had learned everything there was to learn? I doubt it very seriously. The whole book of Romans was written to explain to them some of the deeper understandings of justification by faith and the implications of that. And yet Paul is able to say to these, these former pagans, these former idol worshipers who lived degenerate in degenerate cultures and degenerate lifestyles, I am confident because of the power of the Spirit of God that you are full of moral goodness, that you have a genuine knowledge of the grace and the gospel of God. And then he says, and I'm confident that you have the ability to disciple one another. You have the ability to teach one another. You have the ability to counsel one another from the Scriptures. These new believers have Holy Spirit-given ability to admonish each other. Beloved, this is spiritual maturity that is wrought by the Holy Spirit of God through the application of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the heart of a man and into, into a group of people. Formal, former unbelievers, former unreached peoples. Spiritual maturity. New believers here are effectively ministering by the grace of God. So this, this power radically transforms lives. And you have to believe that. You know what I think we do as Christians? I know I have to, I have to battle this. There are certain types or categories of people in our respective cultures. And we I have to guard against the idea that those people are unreachable. Those people are so wicked, so lost, so depraved, so far from God that, that I just don't even see how they would ever come to Christ. Have you ever thought about that? About a certain person that maybe you know? Or a group of people? We are being reminded by the Apostle Paul that not only is the mission unchanged, but the power is unchanged. 
Secondly, this power enables bold, courageous proclamation of the gospel. Look at verse, look at verse 16. God had called Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. What was, what was the outcome of this calling upon the Apostle Paul? Here it is. So that the offering up of the Gentiles may be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse, again, verse 19. By the power of signs and wonders, and we understand that's, that's, that's the apostolic time. He was an apostle. This is the signs of an apostle. But notice also by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. This power enables bold, courageous proclamation of the gospel. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifested in bold witness. Go back to the early, the early chapters of the book of Acts. The gospel was proclaimed. Persecution came. They were beaten for their faith. They were thrown into, into jail. They were, they were released with a threat that they were not to speak. What do they do? They get on their knees. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. And they cry out for the Holy Spirit's power. And what was the result? They spoke the word with boldness. You can track it all the way through the book of Acts. The sign of Holy Spirit filling was bold proclamation of the gospel. It wasn't speaking in tongues. In the book of Acts, that happened a couple of times. But the indication that a man or a woman was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit is that they were bold in their witness, in their gospel proclamation. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifested by a courageous commitment to the Great Commission. And sometimes, in biblical text that even cost them their lives. We know that of the 12 disciples, only one died of natural causes at the end of a long life. That was the Apostle John. Every other apostle, including the one who wrote this, died before he was an old didn't die of natural causes as an old man. They, were all, they all lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. And, and you, you, know what I, you, know what I, you know what I say? Pe people lay down their lives for much lesser causes. Even in our culture, people lay down their lives gladly, willingly, take risks for much lesser causes than the gospel. Some years ago, I had the opportunity to traveled to Somalia, to the northern part of Somalia. It's called Somaliland. We flew into Hargesia, and then by vehicle we traveled across Somaliland to, um, to, the, to the sea, and then up to the, the, the city of Berabera. When we got to Berabera, we were one of the things that we did, we took a tour of a, of, a, uh, of a boarding school, a boys' boarding school. We were being shown around by, by our host, a Muslim, Muslim scholar, this high school for boys. And there in the office, there was a picture of a couple, a man and a woman. And I asked who they were. Their name was Richard and Enid Eyington. 62 and 61 years old, respectively. They had retired from teaching. They were originally from Great Britain somewhere. And they had retired from teaching after working in Swaziland for 32 years as high school teachers. And then they moved to the self-proclaimed Republic of Somaliland where Richard became the principal of this boys' high school in Somalia. They were, I think they served there for a year or so. 
And one evening, they were sitting in their, their sitting room at their house, watching television, and the plate glass window was shattered by two rifle shots. And both Richard and Enid were killed. In Somaliland. Now, I've, I've read their story. I've read their story in the paper online. I, I don't know if they were Christians or not. But they were willing, as educators, after 32 years down in Swaziland, to go to a place like that because they wanted to bring education to people. In the country where I'm originally from, people are very excited if their children decide to go into the military, join the army. I mean, you know what happens in the army, right? You might actually go into some hot spot and get shot at. What is my point? My point is this. It is the power of the Holy Spirit of God that enables us to proclaim the gospel in difficult places, trusting in a sovereign God who is able to sustain our existence and to glorify his name. This power enables bold, courageous proclamation of the gospel. So the power is unchanged. It radically transforms lives and it enables this bold, courageous proclamation of the gospel. Notice the third principle. As I said, the first one, the mission is unchanged. Number two, the power is unchanged. And here's the third principle, the method is unchanged. The method is unchanged. Look at verse Look at verse 19 again. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been, been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But that is, as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. The method is unchanged. You say, what is God's method? God uses people. God uses people. Notice verse number 24. Paul says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. You see, Paul here is already planning to go to the next unreached area. I'm going to go to Spain. These unreached people, in our, in our day we call them unreached people groups. Groups of people with no sustainable church, no, no consistent gospel witness amongst these people. Again, the Joshua Project has identified 6,425 unreached people groups in our world today. They estimate that's 2.6 billion people, or 40% of the world's population. God uses people. Here, it's the Apostle Paul. He says, I have fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. I've fulfilled the ministry and the task that God has given to me, and now I'm making plans to go to the next area that has not yet been reached. I'm making plans to go to Spain. So God uses people. The method is unchanged. God uses people. Number two, God uses ordinary people, like you and me. Look at verse 16 again. God has called the Apostle Paul to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of God so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. God uses people. God uses ordinary people. You see, the God who ordained the means of salvation, redemption through Jesus Christ, and the message, message 
Salvation through faith alone, in Christ alone, also has ordained the method by which these people will hear the gospel and will believe in Jesus. And that method is the sending of missionaries. That's his method. You see, whenever God sets about to do an impossible task, a monumental task, he always taps someone on the shoulder and says, I want you. Someone has said it this way, to preserve a godly line in time of global judgment, God called on Noah. To call his people back to holiness, God sent an army of bold prophets. You can read their story throughout the Old Testament. To deliver Israel from a plot to wipe, out, to, to wipe out the Jews, God called a young princess by the name of Esther. To rally his people and rebuild Jerusalem, God called Nehemiah. To bring the gospel of salvation to a needy world, God enlisted a teenage virgin by the name of Mary, a leathery desert-dwelling prophet by the name of John the Baptist, and a band of 12 unknown tradesmen. And to spread that gospel to the ends of the earth, God tapped a zealous Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus, whom he transformed into the Apostle Paul. You see, God is a God who teams up with people, you and me. Not because he needs us or that he needs anyone or anything, but because he chooses to use us. What grace! You might be sitting here this evening and you might be saying, Oh, Pastor Phil, let me tell you, you, you don't understand. God wouldn't want me. I mean, you don't understand my fears. You don't know anything about my past failures, my personal inadequacies. I mean, sure, God might want someone in this room, but I'm telling you, God wouldn't want me. There's no way he would want to use me like this. And if that's what you think tonight, you're in good company. Think of the people in Scripture that God used. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit. Paul rejected John Mark. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. The only training that Amos had was the school of fig tree pruning. Solomon was too rich. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Timothy had ulcers. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. John was self-righteous, Naomi was a widow, Paul was a murderer, and so was Moses for that fact. Jonah ran from God, Miriam was a gossip, Gideon and Thomas both doubted, Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal, Elijah was burnt out, Martha was a worry ward, and Noah got drunk. You see, God uses people. God uses common ordinary people like you and me, and God uses equipped people. We just read it in, in verse 16 and, and again in, in, verse, in verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. God uses equipped people. Hold your, hold your place and go over just a page or two to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter number 1. Look what Paul reminds the Corinthians of in verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Why does God choose nobodies? Why does God choose the powerless? 
Why does God choose so often those that according to the world's evaluation and the world's standards, they're just a bunch of foolish nobodies? Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God uses people. God uses common, ordinary people. And God uses equipped people. You see, God provides us with his power and his presence for this work. We call it the Great Commission, and perhaps the, the most famous of those texts is Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, and verse number 18. Look again at what it says. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And here it is. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God uses equipped people, people that he provides with his power and his presence. You see, God is not dependent upon better methods or more machinery or even more money. God is looking for a man who will represent him in this present world. A man through whom he will enact his plan. God calls and the church sends missionaries to lay foundations. Missions lays the foundations for healthy, reproducing churches. You see that in Paul's ministry, churches with trained leaders were left to build upon the foundation of the gospel and to reach out to the unreached areas around them. Paul himself preached in strategic centers throughout the region from Jerusalem to Illyricum, he says in verse number 19. I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. If you look on the map, that's, that's approximately 2,200 kilometers. That's a region, 22 kilometers, 2,200 kilometers long. And he says, I have preached the gospel in this region. Well, why was he so comforted? Did, did, did it mean that in that whole region, 2,200 kilometers, that every single person in those Gentile territories had heard the gospel yet? Well, no, of course not. But why was he confident that his work was done? Because he had, by God's grace and with his power, established strategic, healthy, reproducing churches in the urban centers in that region. And now those churches, it was their responsibility to to saturate that region and to to go with the gospel and to proclaim that gospel in 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 those regions. Three unchanging foundational principles for modern missions. In 2022, the mission has not changed. The power has not changed. And the method that God uses to reach this world with the gospel has not changed. So I want to ask you two questions. Question number one. Have you responded to the gospel by believing? Do you know him? Has your life been radically transformed by Jesus Christ? Can it be said about you that you are full of moral goodness, that you have a knowledge of the scripture, and that you're able to instruct one another, even if you are a newer believer, because of the powerful working of the Holy Spirit of God within you? Have you responded to the gospel by believing? And if your answer to that is, Pastor Phil, I have. It was last year, last week, 20 years ago. I've responded to the gospel by leaving. Then I want to ask you a second question. 
Have you responded to the gospel by obeying? Will you present yourself this evening to God and ask him to reveal where he wants you to intentionally engage in his mission? You see, the church is not a cruise ship designed to bring you comfortably and safely to heaven. It is a battleship storming the gates of hell to deliver those who have all of their lives been in bondage to sin and to Satan. This is our mission. Are you personally engaged in that mission? Father, we thank you that your mission is unchanged. The power for that mission has not changed. And the method that you use and you will use in our generation to take the gospel to the lost in our own communities and to the uttermost parts of the earth, that method has not changed. Fill your people with Holy Spirit power and courage and commitment to you that your mission is our priority. May we make ourselves available to you for whatever your plan is for us. May we be like Hannah, offering our children up for the service of our Lord Jesus Christ, preparing them in our homes for service to you. May you be glorified to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.